that the sun shines down its power to all the world and makes the wind blow strong as it will. I want to hope gentle rains can fall upon the land so lovely earth can stay lovely still. Welcome to Energy Week with George Harvey and Tom Fennell. Only there isn't any Tom Fennell today. He's okay. He's at home, uh, but he's not participating in the show uh, for reasons that are not entirely clear to me. But he um, he's okay in in terms of health, so there's no reason to worry about him. Um, what we're going to do today, as we always do, is go through a week of news re in relation to energy and climate change. The material is uh, derived from my blog, geoharvey.com, G-E-O-H-A-R-V-E-Y. If you go to that blog and you can click on the date for, a, for a, uh, an article that I read, I'm going to try to remember to keep everybody up to date on when the articles are. Or there's a couple of links down below, one of which is to a website that Tom and I use for developing the show, and the other one is to um, a, a uh, file you can download. And in both cases, they have just the material for the show, so you can go there and, and read the article that I'm talking about. Um, we're starting on the 21st of March and ending with the 27th, today being the 28th. This show is normally recorded on Thursday afternoons. And uh, so we're off to the races, I guess, as they say. The first item that we have, let me put this up so you can see it. Um, this is a picture of a nuclear power plant. As I recall, it's in Czechos uh, not Czechoslovakia, in the Czech Republic. Um, the organization that supplied it is panda.org, and you would think that that's a Chinese organization because the Chinese have lots and lots of pandas in, in their materials. But this, in this case, the panda is uh, for the World Wild Wildlife Foundation, which is no longer known by that name. It's the WWF. And the title of the article is WWF, Nuclear Path to Net Zero is a False Narrative. And the synopsis reads, as world leaders gather in Brussels for the Nuclear Energy Summit to identify a role for nuclear energy in the energy transition, WWF argues that the idea that nuclear energy can play a key role in reaching a net zero emissions um, long-term goal of the Paris Agreement is a false narrative. And there are several reasons for this, several reasons why they consider it a false narrative. One is that um, in the amount of time that it takes to build a nuclear power plant, you can build several other power plants that would, will deliver a multiple of the amount of the electricity. And the other, an, another one is that uh, other uh, sources of energy are significantly less expensive. And when I think about this, I always go back to um, a presentation that was given by Next Era Energy, I believe in Ju June of 2022, long presentation, way over 100 pages. But in it, they introduce the idea of what they call near-firm solar and near-firm wind. Near-firm means that these renewable energy types are backed up by sufficient battery that they are, according to Next Air Energy, at least as reliable as nuclear for providing dispatch, um, dispatchable energy during peak demand periods. Now, what Next Air Energy said was that the cost of electricity from near-firm solar and near-firm wind in 2020, I'm sorry, 2030, is expected in both cases to be below four cents per kilowatt hour. 
and at the same time, uh, the cost of, of electricity from new nuclear plants would be in excess of 10 and a half cents per kilowatt hour. So it just doesn't make sense to build nuclear power plants because they aren't as good and they cost more and they take far longer to, to develop. And that's why the World Wildlife Foundation has taken the position it has. Their goal is to get to net, net zero to stop climate change. And um, if you want to do that, nuclear is not the way to do it, according to them. And according to me, I agree with them. Okay, um, our next item, oh, and I should mention, yeah, those are um, eyes on those cooling towers. And they're there, I think, primarily for the purpose of scaring little children. They certainly scare me. Um, and... Um, I don't know what else to say about that. Okay, we have a picture of Panama City, which is, of course, a city in Florida. Um, this is from CNN, and the title is Global Ocean Heat Has Hit a New Record Every Single Day for the Last Year. Okay, this uh, synopsis says the world's oceans have now experienced an entire year of unprecedented heat with a new temperature record broken every day according to data from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, that is the organization well known as NOAA, N-O-A-A, and the University of Maine's Climate Reanalyzer. Of course, it doesn't make much sense to believe that climate change is not happening if you have information like that. But there are people who insist that climate change is not happening. And I don't know how to deal with that. I think they're going to uh, probably stick by that story as long as they possibly can. But some of them are paid to deny that climate change is happening or deny that it's human caused. And by the way, there are scientific reasons why we can be quite sure that it is caused by human beings. Not only is it happening, this thing with the ocean temperatures and the atmospheric temperatures and uh, uh, deer ticks and Lyme disease in Vermont, which were not here when I was a child. Um, all of this stuff uh, is, is uh, being denied by people who are paid deny, to deny it. It's also being denied by other people who have their own reasons to deny it, as are a number of other things. So we just, you know, I think we're in a time when the smart thing to do is to be smart. So I'm going to continue on, my, on in this story. We have next a chart. This is a very unusual chart, I think. It's kind of what is called a hockey stick chart where everything seems to be normal until it goes out of, uh, goes wacky. And in this particular case, what is um, charted is the American crude oil exports from 1920 until, 19, until 2023. And of course, there, you can see that there are huge increases on the right-hand side of the chart, not anywhere else. Um, although, if you had charted this in the year 2000, you would you could have put it into a into a form that where it would look like from 1977 until 2000. There were a lot of exports, but what we've exported recently is a huge amount compared to those. Um, this and I want to I want to point out here that if you look at the years here, the exports started with Barack Obama in the White House. Then they went into kind of supercharged mode with Donald Trump, but they have continued to increase for the most part under, under, um, uh, our, uh, under Joe Biden. So this article is from Clean Technica, and the title is U.S. Crude Oil Experts Reached a Record in 2023 um, U.S. crude oil experts established a record in 2023 averaging 4.1 million barrels per day, 13% more than the previous annual record is set in 2022. 
except for 2021, and you can see that in a little bit of a dip for that year, U.S. crude oil exports have increased every year since 2015 when the ban on most crude oil exports was lifted. Now, I'm going to tell you that um, I don't know this for a fact, uh, but my impression is that the fact that the United States started uh, exporting um, crude oil in the, um, in the quantities it, it has, making it the biggest crude oil exporter in the world, um, made us a few enemies, not the least of which was um, the Russians, who are dependent on export of fossil fuels for two-thirds of their income from foreign trade. So the, the Russians, I think, have been up, uh, upset about this. They've also been upset about the fact that the United States is pushing renewable energy. And um, that, that between them, that, those are reasons why Vladimir Putin is not happy with us. Okay, we're up to Friday, March 22nd. We have a picture of a thing called an, an atomium. And the, the atomium is a structure, um, decorative structure, a sculpture, sculpture, if you will, in uh, Belgium, um, in Brussels. And this is from ABC News. The title is, Leaders of Over 30 Countries Meet in a Brussels Summit to Promote Nuclear Energy. Um, in the shadow of a giant monument glorifying nuclear power, which you're seeing in that picture, over 30 nations from around the world pledged to use controversial energy source um, uh, nuclear power to help achieve climate neutral globe while providing countries with an added sense of strategic uh, security. Now, I'm going to tell you that truthfully, I think that this is a, an effort that is bound to failure on both counts. If they want to have climate neutrality, nuclear power is not the best way to do it. It's possibly the worst way to do it that actually can achieve it. Um, and as I said earlier, it's extremely expensive, very slow to build, and um, uh, has, well, a whole, a whole variety of other problems, including what to do with waste and so forth, and um, we, will, we will go into this a little bit more. I know there's going to be something about it next week. I believe there's going to be something about it next week because that opposition, such as was coming from the World Wildlife Fund, is being uh, brought up by other organizations. Okay, next we have a picture of the world Actually, what you're seeing here is the world's oceans, and I guess it's just the oceans. The Great Lakes are not in here. Uh, this is from Clean Technica. Uh, what you're seeing there is anomalies in the temperature of the sea surface. Red is a uh, greatest anomaly in a, in a positive direction, and there are some anom anomalies in uh, noted in blue, but not many. Um, again, the article comes from Clean Technica, and the title is WMO, The Earth Continues to Warm as Nations Ignore Climate Science. Scientists and office holders are gathering in Copenhagen to discuss how to meet nationally set contributions they agreed to at the 2015 Paris Climate Accords, the nations have been unable to reduce emissions as they struggle to, um, as they strengthen their embrace of fossil fuels. Well, that's the reason we haven't been able to do anything with um, climate em emissions and reducing them is because the, the countries are dependent on fossil fuels and the fossil fuels organizations are making sure that Every politician in the world has got an endowment of whatever is needed to get him happy with fossil fuels. Um, 
And uh, you know, I could, you might ask, am I saying that things are corrupt? And the answer is yes, I think things are corrupt. Uh, fossil fuels organizations, I have said before and will say again, no doubt, uh, will lie, cheat, steal, and kill to get their, their profits. Kill? Yes, kill. Uh, uh, in Vermont, we have 250 to th something over 300 people die every year because of air pollution from fossil fuels. That's according to the um, American Lung uh, uh, American Lung Association in California, which did a study of, I think it was eight states, one of which was Vermont. And they found, you know, Vermonters die of air pollution. People move to Vermont to get away from air pollution, but you know, if you, Vermont has enough air pollution that some people die, and a lot of our air pollution comes from vehicles. Okay, our next item involves a photograph of transmission lines with Mount Hood in the background. It would be much prettier, of course, if the transmission lines were not there and it was just Mount Hood. But the uh, article comes from Clean Technica, and uh, the title is FERC Affirms Decision to Hold Utilities Accountable for Interconnection Delays. FERC, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, affirmed its determination on key provisions in order num number 2023, its landmark interconnection ruling. FERC can penalize utilities and transmission owners that fail to respond to interconnection requests in good time. So basically what's happening here is that the, the we have probably, we have enough renewable energy um, uh, we have enough uh, requests for for new renewable energy to, to be put in to provide us with all the power we need, as I read it. The problem is the transmission lines. You have to get those transmission lines from, if you're putting in a, a, a wind farm in Michigan and you want the, the electricity to be delivered to the grid, you have to get that transmission line in. And unfortunately, where it's delivered to the grid, the grid might not be quite strong enough and it would have to be upgraded so that it will go further. And that costs money. Now, I'm going to give you my take on this too, which is this is a false problem that we should really be avoiding because what we should be doing is putting in renewable energy and not attaching it to the grid primarily, but using it as a basis for microgrids that would be local. In Vermont, that would mean that we would have more wind turbines and more photovoltaic um, uh, sites, but it would also mean that we'd have less possibly transmission towers and the transmission towers could be smaller. And um, the reason for that is because we would be generating local energy and we would be using it locally. Now, one other thing about this is not only would it decrease air pollution, but it would also, um, it would also mean that we would not have to export a billion dollars a year for the energy that we import. Uh, we, because we'd be making it locally. And it means that the people import, the, who are employed to manage and maintain those uh, renewable energy uh, sites would be local people. Uh, and so, you know, this, it, would, it would make a huge difference. And yes, there would be people who would complain about that. Um, their, their complaints, I think, are not really all that valid. Um, for a variety of reasons, one of which is if you take a solar uh, array that's in a farm field, for example, if it's there now, it's not the way it's going to be done in the future, very likely, because we're developing more and more agrivoltaics, and they look less and less like what we have had in the past. So, um, you know, I think you have to be open to, to new um, 
forms of renewable energy. The other thing is wind turbines. Um, yes, a wind turbine will kill a bird once in a while. And um, that's sad. But the fact is a car will kill a bird once in a while by striking it. It will also kill birds on a continuous basis by emitting polluting materials. And, uh, you know, I, I, I'm looking for the bottom line here, which is that we do the best job we can with the environment, and I'm not impressed by, by the idea that birds are cured, killed by wind turbines when the fact is we're looking at the possibility of entire species, such as the Baltimore Oriole, going extinct. And uh, so, you know, yeah, there are wind farms that should not be built because they're in places where birds will be killed in great numbers. But we should deal with that on a case-by-case -case basis. Okay, we have a, um, we're up to Sunday, March 23rd. We have a picture of the Palisades nuclear plant. And um, this is an article from Michigan Public. The title is International Nuclear Energy Expert Questions Michigan's Palisades Restart. Is investing $1.8 billion in federal and state funds to restart the aged Palisades nuclear power plant on the, Lake, on the Lake Michigan shore necessary for Michigan's climate goals? Question mark. This is one of the, one of the questions Paris-based international nuclear poly, uh, uh, policy analyst Michael Snyders uh, raised. And of course, we're back to, uh, what's going on with this? There we go. Um, it's one of the things, we're back to the, to the question of, is this really a good idea to be running an old nuclear power plant? I want to point out, on the right side of this picture, you see two rows of things that are, it looks like they're smoking. They're not smoking. That's not smoke. That's steam. This is, uh, these are cooling towers of the same type that was installed at Vermont Yankee. This is a bigger plant than Vermont Yankee, but those cooling towers are of the same type. And uh, this is an old plant. And I personally believe that $1.8 billion could be better spent if you want to get climate change out of the picture. But uh, this is the reality that we're in. Ah, our next picture is one of my favorite. This is from Clean Technica. Let me put this up. This is a picture of agrivoltaics using bio-based components to raise solar panels above the crops. And you can see there's a tractor under there, under the, the panels. The panels are pretty high up. Um, the title is Gorgeous Agrivoltaic System Gilds the Rural Solar Lily. The agrivoltaic movement is important for the renewable energy field because it pulls the rug out from under critics who argue against solar energy, uh, citing solar arrays on farmland. The only thing missing now is aesthetics, and the European research firm, Agro Solar Europe, has the solution, and you're seeing the solution here. The solution is the bio-based components. In this case, the mounting system is entirely made up of biological materials that can be composted at the end of the solar site's use in 30 years. And um, this is uh, also, there's, there are a number of things going on here. Uh, uh, the, oh, I'm thinking of the wrong name, um, a European research organization that I should be able to think of the name of and I'm not able to do it right now, um, said that the they, you know, in a test that compared um, two fields that were identically treated and raising uh, tomatoes, the one that was under solar uh, panels outproduced the other by over 100%. So one of them produced 200% of the, an amount, and the other one produced 100%. And the, the one that was out in the sun didn't do as well. I mentioned that to a friend of mine who is an avid gardener and, and well-versed in, uh, in gardening, and she said, well, you know, that makes sense because tomato is an understory 
crop. They don't like sunshine all that much. So, you know, there you go. Okay, we are, um, we have an article. The next article is from Seven Days. I, I did that without coming back to myself. So you have a picture of the Vermont State House. The um, title is a debate about the cost of, about the cost is dogging renewable energy bill. It is not certain how much it will cost if utilities are required to sell only renewable electricity by 2035. That's the goal of H289, a bill that raises the state's renewable energy requirements. Cost estimates have ranged from as little as $150 million to as high as a billion dollars. This is what happens, unfortunately. You have uh, cost analysis from different organizations, some of which uh, are, are there to show that their uh, energy source is cheaper than the other. And in this case, such an organization, if, they, if they're being paid by na a natural gas company or a nuclear company, would say, yeah, well, it's going to cost you a billion dollars to do what you want to do. Others uh, say 150 million. There's a lot that goes into this. One of the things that goes into it is what's called rights law. And rights law is a really interesting law that talks about how the cost of new technology is likely to decline. And not just decline, but decline in a very, very highly predictable manner. This, uh, the decline was what brought um, Ford's vehicles down price uh, during the 19-teens and 1920s. The price of, ca of cars went down an enormous amount. And uh, the, at the same time that Henry Ford was paying his workers more to produce, uh, to produce um, cars in fewer hours, and the, and the factories were producing more cars. This kind of thing happens very frequently when you're talking about new technology, like solar panels, like the uh, much of what goes in, into wind turbines. Um, it is not going to be happening with the same kind of frequency when you're talking about old technology. Nuclear is old technology, by the way, except for the small modular reactors coming along are newer. But, you know, that's what it is. Um, but certainly coal and gas is old technology. Let me, let me bring us up to the next item. These are, uh, it looks like, it looks like this is just a bunch of girls, some of them very young, walking down a road carrying containers full of water. Um, this is from Punch Newspapers. This Punch Newspapers in this case, I believe, is a Nigerian organization. The title is Renewable Energy is Key to Tackling Water a global water crisis, according to the IEA. The IEA is the International Ener Energy Agency, which is a UN organization. It is seeking to reduce the amount of water used in generating uh, energy globally. In place of fossil fuels like oil, gas, and coal, the IEA s is said use of renewable energies like wind and solar panels would reduce water use in the energy sector. Yes, it will reduce water use, and it will not just reduce it, it will reduce it by an enormous amount. I'll give you an example, Vermont Yankee. It had cooling towers, it also could, could cool the plant with water from the Connecticut River. Now, the nature of, of thermal power plants is that approximately two-thirds of the heat that is used to generate the electricity, because you're, in most cases, making electricity by generating steam, approximately two-thirds of that heat is lost. It is, um, these plants do not run at much above one-third efficiency, 35% efficiency, for it, perhaps. And that's why they had those cooling towers. A, uh, an engineer at Vermont Yankee told me 
that if they could trap that heat and deliver it to houses in Vermont, it would have been possible to heat every house in Vermont with waste heat from Vermont Yankee. But they couldn't do it. So um, that's, that it just tells you how much heat is used, and that heat is dissipated by using water. So regardless of whether it's nuclear or natural gas or coal or whatever, if you have a large power plant, you're going to have, a, in mo almost all cases, large amounts of water in use. And I have seen stories about um, coal-burning power plant that had to shut down because it didn't have water coming in to, uh, to cool its operations. Um, and, the, and the reason it didn't have water was because of drought. Now, the one that I'm thinking of at the moment actually is in um, India. But, you know, they, they had showed the water intake, which was basically a small canal, and it was bone dry, so they couldn't run the plant. Okay, our next item is a picture of an Australian paddock. This is from Renew Economy, which is an Australian publisher. Farmers double the value of back paddocks with renewable power deals. The founder of Australia's first renewable energy land acquisition agency. Can you imagine owning such a thing? Daniel Morocco says he found land for four gigawatts of big battery projects and 800 megawatts of solar farms over 30 individual agreements in four Australian states. Some farmers doubled the value of their back paddocks. Again, you know, from the point of view of how things are going in Vermont, farming has never been easy. And if a farmer can get some um, income from renewable energy or battery storage on his farm, that may be sufficient to keep his farm going. And I think it's a false argument to say that we need to keep the farmland used for for growing food or whatever it grows and not used for new renewable energy. And people try to do that. But what you're doing, if you're doing that, is saying that the farmer is not allowed, should not be allowed, to make extra income. And that might put him out of business. And that, I think, is a sad thing to try to tell people, that they shouldn't be allowed to make the money that would keep them in business. OK, our next item. We have a picture of wind turbines on and near a show, shore. These are uh, offshore and onshore kind of together. This is from Energy Digital Magazine. Offshore wind growth continues in pursuit of climate targets. OK, McKinsey research suggests global installed offshore wind capacity is expected to reach 630 gigawatts. What's a gigawatt time? A gigawatt is a bigawatt. By 2050, up from 20, 40 gigawatts in 2020. Think about that. It's growing from 40 gigawatts to 630 gigawatts. Now, a gigawatt of wind, offshore wind, um, is not the same as a gigawatt of nuclear because nuclear has a generating capacity which is between 80 and 92 or 3 percent, where Offshore wind is going to have a generating capacity that's going to be probably in the neighborhood of 40 to 55 percent. So 630 gigawatts is probably the equivalent of 300 um, largish nuclear power plants. This is just a small part of wind installations. The IEA says that offshore wind farms account for just 7 percent of installed wind capacity. Well, what they're talking about is turning that 7% into something that's considerably more notable. We are up to Monday, March 25th, and um, we have a picture of, oil sand, of an oil sand site in Canada. This is from Reuters. Canada pushes nuclear power to get at oil sands. They are pushing nuclear power in order to get at oil sands. Natural Resources Minister Gary Lunn said discussions are already in place with the oil industry in the province of Alberta 
to use nuclear power to extract oil from oil sands. He believes that nuclear energy is helping get heavy, um, helping get heavy crude out of the ground will help cut greenhouse gas emissions. And I am flabbergasted by this. They're saying that by getting what is possibly the dirtiest oil in the world out of the ground with nuclear power is going to be good for gr greenhouse gas emissions. I don't buy it. Anyway, that's the site. And um, we, should, we should move on and get away from it. Okay, let's do that. Uh, we have an article now for, from ABC News, a picture of the Cario River. Um, the title is, To Make Water Last Year Round, Kenyans in Dry Regions Are Building Sand Dams on Seasonal Rivers. Now, I, I have to, well, let me read the, the synopsis and then I'll explain. Kenyans are building sand dams so they can harvest water from seasonal rivers. The barriers, which are typically made of concrete, impede water flow so grains of sand settle behind them, creating artificial aquifers that fill up during rainy seasons. The idea here makes a certain amount of sense, and I've, I've read people talking about how this should be done in the United States. If you, if you have a lot of water and you don't want it to evaporate, one way to do that is to cover it by, with sand, which of course will sink to the bottom, but if you can cover the, the entire amount of water with sand, it won't evaporate very f fast. Um, and the result of this is that you can create an, an, an aquifer. When these dams are called sand dams, they're not made of sand. They are there to trap sand. They are sand dams, damming sand, coming down the river. The sand will come down the river when the river is running quickly, and it will settle there, which means that you're filling up your 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 area behind the dam with sand very quickly without really putting any energy into it. Um, but what happens then is you've got an area that is, has a, a large um, aquifer that you can draw wa water from over a long period of time without having to worry about it evaporating. In, and this is happening in a desert, so it would evaporate. Okay, our next item um, it, we have a picture of a second-generation Tesla Roadster, and um, let me put that up. Second-generation Tesla Roadster, and this is from Clean Technica. Lower-priced Tesla Model 2 production to begin in 2025. After Clean Technica, Zach Shahan, Zach Shahan is the editor of Clean Technica. Termed the incoming, uh, termed the coming affordable, affordable Tesla, the Model 2, as a joke for a while, Elon Musk said it won't have that name. Musk loves letters. The Model 3 exists only because the Ford has the rights to the Model E. Regardless, the new Tesla is expected to start at $25,000 or less. And at that price, we're talking about a low-priced car. So this is something that could have an effect on the, on the uh, market. Okay, we're up to Tuesday, March 26th, and we have a picture of a, um, okay, a town in New Mexico. This is Animas, New Mexico. And this is from AOL.com. The title is, Geothermal Advancements Incentives Could Help New Mexico Meet Renewable Energy Goals. That's advancements and incentives. In the title, it's just a, tiny, a comma between the two. About 70 years ago, in anonymous drillers going after water for irrigation stumbled upon extremely hot water naturally bubbling up out of the ground. The spot would later become the location of New Mexico's first utility-scale geothermal power plant. So this particular um, site, the, the town of Animas, has a geothermal power plant, which I believe is probably not in this picture. 
by the way, the, the round area on the left side is a farm field that is irrigated by uh, an irrigation system that goes around a central spigot. So it's, this is, you know, it's just a big um, irrigated farm field. It would make sense that if they're extracting water from the ground to get heat, they've got water and that water could be used elsewhere for irrigation. So it might be actually used from that. But what's happening in New Mexico is that various organizations um, are, are looking hard at getting uh, geothermal heat to uh, make electricity. And that is becoming new, part of the state's uh, set of goals for energy in the future. Okay, we have a picture of bananas. And this is from CNN. And the title says, Trader Joe's just increased the price of a banana for the first time in 20 years. Let me show you the bananas. I don't think those bananas are at Trader Joe's. And I, the reason I say that is because those bananas have, have black areas, and I think that bananas at Trader Joe's probably wouldn't have them. But nevertheless, it is a picture of bananas. They are bananas. Um, Trader Joe's told CNN that it raised the price of a banana to 23 cents, which is an increase of more than 20 percent. The grocer has sold bananas for 19 cents each over two decades. World Banana Forum, Forum experts had warned that climate change can drive up banana prices. And by the way, uh, Trader Joe's did raise the price of bananas, but apparently it also reduced prices for other things. So. This is not a uniform uh, signal of terrible things happening to food prices. Terrible things have happened to food prices, but um, this is just one illustration. Okay, um, we have a picture here, which is a rendering of a Tello truck. Um, the red vehicle there is, is the Tello truck, and this is an artist rendering. Um, this is from Clean Technica. The title is, the Tello electric pickup is a tiny truck with big features. Um, if you want to buy an electric pickup truck, your options are still fairly limited, but they are available. However, if you want to buy a little truck, not your standard full-size pickup, you're almost out of luck. Standard full-size pickup, by the way, is uh, comes in two sizes. One is very big and the other is huge. Um, now, it says here, Tello trucks might be about to produce a solution for that. And the, the solution that they've got is that little red thing that you see on the screen. Um, that red truck, obviously, is a four-door vehicle. Uh, and it's got a, uh, well, not a huge body in the back, but it's, a, it's the size of a sedan, so it's um, a fairly small vehicle, and they are banking on the idea that people want small trucks, and I can certainly sympathize with people who want small trucks, and they don't want to buy a, um, uh, a Tesla uh, pickup truck. I'll tell you, the Tesla pickup truck is so ugly. I don't think I could, I could even think of buying one. That's just my opinion. Other people think that it's. I don't know. I don't know anybody who said that it's beautiful, but some people find the design kind of exciting. But um, there are other companies that are that are bringing out uh, trucks, and it's interesting to me that the conventional American automotive market, which consists of, in the old days, it was GM, Ford, and Chrysler. Now it's GM, Ford, and Stellantis. But Stellantis includes uh, Fiat, so it's more than just American. Those, those companies have been really falling behind badly in the um, world market. Compared to China, they're doing a, they're they're really just they're not doing a good job. Ford 
probably a little bit. Um, GM has talked about it. Stellantis is doing a little work, particularly in Europe. But um, we've got in this country so far behind uh, China in a lot of these things that it's it's going to be difficult to to uh, get our lead back. Okay, we have an item from the Daily Maverick and a picture of wind turbines. And there is the picture of wind turbines. The article says renewables, the only energy solution that can avert climate disaster, conference told. When it is um, the sovereign right, while it is the sovereign right and prerogative of nations to choose their energy mix, the arguments for adding new nuclear are weak, according to the Director General of the International Renewable Energy Agency, uh, Francisco La Camara. And basically, this goes back, and this was partly because of that conference that um, I was talking about just a moment ago, um, in which uh, people from, le you know, leaders, utility people, uh, CEOs, other people from 30 countries gathered to talk about how they should resurrect nuclear power. And they've been talking about this. Um, they've been talking about resurrecting nuclear power. And they've been getting a lot of feedback saying this is not a good idea. Now, admittedly, they are getting feedback saying this is a great idea. But it, it is not a good idea, in, in my opinion, because it just costs a lot of money. And it takes a lot of time. And it doesn't do anything positive, as far as I can tell. So, you know, that is a, uh, that's a kind of a problem. OK, our next item is from ABC News. And we have a picture here of cherry trees standing at the edge of the land in salt water. The salt water has risen, and the cherry tree trees have their roots in salt water. Um, and the title of the article is, Why Stumpy DC's Iconic Cherry Tree is Drawing So Much Attention. A hollowed out small cherry tree in Washington, DC is getting major amount of attention ahead of its removal from the tidal basin because of climate change. Over the last century, sea levels in Washington, D.C. have risen by over a foot, according to NOAA. Now, what's happened here, of course, is this picture doesn't, doesn't have a, this, this picture didn't have a, uh, Stumpy isn't it? Let me put it that way. But, um, Stumpy uh, is a tree that has a, a trunk that is several, a few inches through. And the trump, trunk is rotting uh, on the inside. The tree has a branch or two with, with uh, flowers on it. And it's really about as pathetic looking as any tree I've ever seen. This is not a happy tree. And these, the trees in the photograph there are not happy trees. They're, they're in trouble because their roots are in salt water. And a lot of, uh, some, some plants can grow just fine with their roots in salt water. And cherry trees happen to be perhaps better than some other plants, but they aren't designed for salt water. And, you know, this is, you can, you can see that there's a walkway on there that is supposed to be going from one place to another where people can walk, and it's just going down to the water. Uh, Washington, D.C. is a low area, um, and these trees are in, in trouble. Um, it's, not, it's not practical to move them, so they're going to be removed. Now, they've been there for over 100 years, they were gift, uh, gifts of the Japanese, I think, immediately after the First World War. But I might be mistaken about that dating. But these are the ones that were, in a, were part of a group that, after the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor, 
1941, people in Washington just went down and started cutting them down because they were so angry at the Japanese. And um, there was, you know, some reaction to that. There were people who, who uh, pointed out quite rightly that the trees didn't drop bombs on Pearl Harbor. But nevertheless, there were people who, um, there, were, there were people who cut them down. Now they're going to have to be cut, cut down. They're going to be cut down by, I think it's the National Park Service, because they're in, in an area where, where climate change has, has uh, raised the level of the water to the point where they're dying because they're, they've got their feet, so to speak, in, in salt water, and uh, they, can't, they can't live. They're going to die one way or the other. So they're going to be taken out. And what they're going to be replaced with, I don't know. But um, they, you know, the National Park Service will undoubtedly replace them with something that they deem appropriate for the purpose. Okay, our next story is our last. And this is a story from Clean Technica. It has a picture of a uh, service operations vehicle. Um, and this is uh, courtesy of ESVAGT. And I don't know offhand what that stands for, but it's probably an acronym for something. Anyway, the title for this uh, article is Offshore Industry, Wind Industry, wants to shed its fossil fuel work boats. Um, the offshore wind industry seems to want to go beyond producing carbon-free renewable energy. They, also are, they are also replacing the fuels used by their working vehicle, vehicles. Electric power is on the menu as a long-term solution, and alternative fuels are getting attention for now. Now, what they're, what they're talking about doing is um, the boats like the one that we were just looking at. Let me put it back up. Boats like this are powered, uh, most of them, by oil. They, they use diesel engines to operate the boats. I know that's a very weird-looking boat. Believe me, it's a weird boat. These are working boats that are used in wind farms. And just look at the... At the electronics that are on the on the um, roof of the bridge and everything about this thing is is strange and you see these these uh, working boats that have helicopter landing areas on them and cranes and they haul around masts that go up 60 or 70 feet in the air and stuff like that it's it's just an extremely strange way to do things but um, the, the boats that, that they have, they're starting to supply with a renewable fuel, what is called a renewable fuel, which means that they're, you know, this is the old business of getting grease and turning it into um, oil that can be used for in these boats. Um, but the other solution is to build new boats that are... Uh, purpose-built to have to be run on uh, el electricity. So um, if Tom were here, I'd joke about those, those boats. They have having a choice of either a really long extension cord that they operate by or that uh, they have big batteries on them. And of course, it would be big batteries. The batteries would be charged, and then they would come out to sea and um, do the work that they have to do. And by the way, that th the idea of, of doing work at sea uh, from, from a boat that's powered by a big battery is not as strange as it sounds. Uh, Iceland, for example, and I don't remember when this was, but it was years ago, uh, declared that all of its fishing boats, all of its fishing fleet, and fishing is important for the people in Iceland, the Icelandic fishing fleet was going to be powered entirely by electricity. All of their boats were going to be uh, were going to be powered by electricity from batteries that they had on board. And um, that's you know if you think about it, well the battery can 
can lose enough electricity that you can't power the boat? Yeah. And the diesel tank can be punctured or you, you just stay out too long and you can't make it back on diesel energy. So that's all uh, part of the, part of the uh, standard uh, thing. Well, in this particular case, it isn't a fishing boat. They, they uh, are talking about the boats that go out to service those um, wind turbines. And the wind turbines do get serviced. I don't know how often offshore wind turbines get serviced, but you know, if you have a, an offshore wind farm, you're going to have personnel who are permanently employed servicing those wind turbines. And that job is a, you go out on a boat and you go up to the wind turbine and the wind turbine has a door down near the bottom. Um, and you open the door and you go in and close the door and climb a ladder that goes from the bottom to the top. And that might be the equivalent of going up, I'm going to guess 300, three, 30 stories maybe, 40 stories, just straight up on a ladder. Obviously, this is not something that is going to be done by people who are in bad physical shape. But there's, it's a lot of work and they have uh, boats that are just out there to get these people around and to provide them with anything they need, which would be everything from lubricants to possibly spare parts in some cases. Anyway, there we are. That's today's stories. We have a final um, slide, which is just a goodbye saying, have a, per have a perfectly lovely week, which is the wish that Tom and I have. Now, I'm going to wave goodbye, and I'm going to tell you truthfully this time that Tom is undoubtedly not waving goodbye right now because he didn't take part, and so he can't synchronize his, his uh, waving with mine. However, I will say one thing, and that is there is a possibility that his cat is waving goodbye. So there you have it. Have a lovely week, and I hope you come back, as Tom would say, Come on back next, oh, he, I can't do it right. Just come back next time. Bye-bye.